I don't know what the future of aviation is. I mean, this isn't like, you know, open up your magic eight ball and, and say, do, do, should I take a sweater tomorrow? It's cold outside. Or, or an umbrella because it's going to rain. This is stand here in front of all of you and tell you, an educated audience, the future of aviation. Oh, and by the way, we're going to put it on YouTube for all eternity. Predicting the future is really hard. But there's one thing I can, I can take some comfort in, is that I know anything I tell you, there's one certainty. I'm guaranteed to be wrong. So I can fall back on that and be comfortable. But if I think a little bit, if, we, if, if you're a little bit clever about how you do it, maybe we can be less wrong about our forecasting. So there's a little known secret about uh, aviation predictions and, and, and transportation and infrastructure as well, that we tend to be very, very overly optimistic, maybe you've noticed. So there's some research here that shows us that um, all these projects tend to be overly excited about, they, they overpredict how great these projects are going to come out, right? And they underpredict how hard they are to be able to complete or how much they're going to cost. So, how do we do this research? How do we think about this? Well, good research means let's look what other people have done. How did they come up with the ideas, right? Maybe I can learn from the past. So I did that. I looked at old forecasts, those that looked about 25, 30 years into the future to now, right? What did they say? What did they think the future was going to look like? And what did I learn by this? I learned that the ones that were broad thinking, that try to encompass a lot of different variables and a different facets of the problem, they were the ones that were a little bit more uh, accurate with their forecasting. They predicted the end of supersonic travel. They predicted computer reservation and ticketing systems, teleconferencing being a challenge for uh, you know, a competition to air travel. The ones that were a little bit narrower, that were very hyper-focused on one subject, they, they tended to be way off. So what does this tell us? That we need to think broadly. We need to think about all of the different things uh, that, that, that can come into this. What does that mean? What does it mean to be looking broadly, right? Thinking broadly, sorry. It means we think about the technology, the infrastructure, the supply chain, the, the climate effects, the, the labor, the uh, environmental effects the regulatory policy, geopolitics, all of these things. We, we, if, we, if we incorporate all those facets of the problem, we get a better chance of being more accurate with our forecasting. If we step back a little bit, we can see all of these things help us recognize that you know, we don't have to choose air travel. Right? It's part of our multimodal transportation system. We don't have to choose it. We choose it when it's the best of our cost, our time, our convenience. We also like to know that it's safe and it's reliable, especially reliable. We're very particular about that. And what do I mean by that? It means when we want to go somewhere, we want to know that that thing that we're going to choose is going to get us there with pretty high certainty. We can see, like, this is how we choose our modes of travel when we're thinking about how, how far we have to go. And on the left, we can see when our trip distance is really short, like if you live nearby and you're coming to this theater, you may have walked or you may have driven. But as the distance goes farther and farther, we all drive. I mean, you can see the, the numbers. These are, this is real research. And you can see that you know, the car is king over much of that distance, except when we get to the point where we've driven about the length of a day, then we prefer to fly. And we fly because, let's face it, airplanes are fast, right? They get us to distance a lot faster than other modes. And that's a definitely a true statement, but it's actually, it's been truer in the past. Now, this graph shows us that there's, um, these are the speeds that aircraft take. And what I mean by these numbers is these are the gate-to-gate uh, -gate times. 
So this is the time you leave the gate at one end, you get to the net gate at the other end, right? So the speed, average speed, that includes being on the ground, taxiing, all the things once the aircraft leaves the gate. It doesn't include the time it takes you to get to and from the airport, the time it takes you're stuck in TSA lines. It doesn't include any of that. That makes the whole trip shorter. This is just the air travel portion. And the one thing I immediately noticed, obviously you all see this, right? That it was faster in the past. But then when I tell you that over this same time span, the traffic grew four times. Then you think, well, that makes a little bit sense, right? If I told you I was gonna put four times as many cars on the streets, you better bet you're gonna drive slower. The next thing I notice is at the, at the one end, at the, at the shorter end, aircraft, you know, the speeds tend to be slower. Well, that's also not surprising because those are the markets where um, the, the smaller aircraft fly those markets, and they tend to fly slower than the, the long distance and larger aircraft. And they actually also have an, uh, a greater effect on that slowdown. And let's look at an, ex an example of this, an extreme example. Here is an uh, Alaska Airlines flight from Washington Dulles to Washington Reagan. Yeah, it's this crazy curve, right? Why would it do that? Well, I'll, I'll tell you. It's 24 miles directly between the airports. It's 30 if you drive. But it's 64 miles that this air flight fl flown, right? And, and why do they do that? Well, because of congestion in the air. We need to route the aircraft uh, this particular way because there's other flights that are demanding for that airspace. And we don't often think of that because it's hard to vision when it's up in the air. That's, we don't see that. But it's clearly, it's faster to drive. So another thing that's embedded in these numbers is the, the weather delays that you're probably familiar with, right? Those weather delays actually disadvantage the smaller aircraft even more, right? They're, they can't perform uh, as well under weather as the larger aircraft can. They also, the shorter distance flights are also penalized because that's how we manage our air traffic system. This part is bad news, right? We have all these weather disasters going. Um, we have uh, the, the, some of the, the like the, the extreme heats, right? Uh, the, the high winds, they impact aircraft also, also impacting the smaller aircraft more than the, than the larger aircraft. We have these Disruptive storms, and you can see by the green lines, the disruptive storms are growing. And those are the ones that are stopping, you know, air traffic or disrupting our travel, getting back to that reliability thing, right? So we see that, and, and we know it, that intensity is also growing with these types of storms. But now, it's not all bad news. <laughs> the uh, the computer, computational power has been growing steadily. We have, this is Moore's Law, the amount of transistors on a microchip that's been doubling every two years. That means we're able to have much more advanced automation in the cockpits and on, on the ground. We're able to use AI in aviation. But unfortunately, that same technology ends up being the target of cyber attacks. And we're seeing those increasing in number and in sophistication. Physical, on the other hand, physical uh, advances in technology, they tend to move slower. They're still hard. And it reminds us that, you know, the Wright brothers and all of their efforts, not far from here, right, um, we're, we're still not that far in the rearview mirror. So let's go back. Let's think about where we're at so far. We know we have, we see things with rose-colored glasses. We know that um, we have to take a broad view of things. And with that broad view, we can see aviation isn't our only choice. You know, we step larger than the problem that we're supposed to be solving tonight. We see that uh, climate change and cyber attacks are threatening that reliability that we like so much in our travel. So with that in mind, 
what should we think about? Let's go about back to talking about the future of aviation. Now, there are tons of exciting new topics, new uh, technology coming out and emerging. There's uh, uh, alternative fuels, renewable fuels, renewable energy, new engine designs and airframe designs that may soon see the return of supersonic travel, may soon see all electric commercial flights. We see um, space launch, commercial space launch, has lowered the cost to access to space. And the cadence of launches are going up pre precipitously. But that's not what you want me to talk about. You want me to talk about what everybody thinks about when this is out their windshield. When everybody around them is telling them you're number one, everybody thinks about the flying car. The flying car, what a fantastic idea, right? We've been dreaming this, a dream that's as old as the, 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 the aircraft itself, practically. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating there. The ability to rise up and fly over the traffic, right? and sit there and leave those poor saps behind stuck on the highway while we go wherever we want because we have this beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, mode of travel now. The current version of this effort to make the flying car is called the advanced air mobility. It's really what it is is just a combination of the private aircraft and, and drone technology. And from drone technology, they're using this. Um, they're, they're expanding it, and so we see them that they're um, electric powered, and that they take off and land vertically, and that would enable them to land on rooftops, on the tops of parking decks. They also land at traditional airports too, and at heliports, which, by the way, they're now starting to rebrand as vertiports. And we're seeing imagery. I mean, th the marketing. We talk about the, the rose-colored glass, the marketing of these things. It's, it's amazing. You know, we're seeing all these amazing images. They bring out that, that little boy in me, that excitement. Wow, I can't wait for this stuff, right? I remember these movies and television shows where they're, where, where they're, where they're envisioning these things, like Star Wars and Blade Runner and Back to the Future. And, of course, everybody goes to the reference, the Jetsons. But the problem with these shows is that they kind of hand-waved away the real problems. It's, oh, it's wonderful that these vehicles work. <laughs> they just forgot about those, right? Luke Skywalker riding across the desert, he didn't have to have a new hope that, my gosh, let me find a gas station, right? And Doc Brown, sure, we don't need roads where we're going, but you need, maybe you didn't need uh, coordinated departure paths. And the Jetsons. That the, the, air, the aircraft flew by, and it, it made like a noise that wasn't obnoxious, it was actually pleasant. And, and parking was a breeze, if you remember. All he did was, when he got out of the car, it folded up neatly into a briefcase. Those are the hard problems. Those are the hard problems that we were having a hard time solving. So what do we do about that kind of stuff? How do we incorporate our thinking? These cars are coming. They're, 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 they're in development. But there's been a lot of studies around these things and to, to f kind of try to solve some of these problems. Like this study in 2024 that looked at air mobility in West Virginia. It's, they said, we're going to provide service to underutilized and neglected markets. Provides service to underutilized and neglected markets. That sounds really familiar. Oh, I read that before. It was in this 2005 study on very light jets. And then there's another study in 2023 on urban air mobility infrastructure. They're going to operate on a network of vertiports and reduce the, the airport congestion and even congestion on the roadways. Not surprising. That was in a 1991 study on the civil tilt rotors. And then there's this 
other study about air mobility in Illinois. Oops. I think I know that guy. Um, they talked about shifting to air travel over ground transportation. But so did this 1979 study. Well, I think you get the point, right? We've been sold this idea for decades. Should we fault this research? No, I don't think we should. I think everybody's excited about that flying car, a thing we've been dreaming about forever. But, you know, even the FAA now is saying that we're going to need 3,000 vertiports dotting across our metro areas. And within six years of this starting operations, they're going to have 10,000 flights a day. Just to put that in perspective, right now we have 45,000 flights a day in our national airspace system as it is. Is that congestion going to make things so hard that there's no, it's not enticing to use these vehicles like that circuitous flight path we saw? And pushes back into saying, forget it, I'm just going to drive. Are there uh, other aspects, like the fact that the weather extremes are building up, and where do they affect more the smaller aircraft? Again, degrading the reliability, again saying, ah, forget it, I'm going to drive. Or any of those other things, we talked about that vast amount of array of wide and broad thinking. Any of that stuff going to say, yeah, maybe it's just a passing fad again just like those other technologies I mentioned. These vehicles, the flying car, all this kind of stuff is right at that tipping point right now. Right? That's where that tipping point is. We're sitting there between the skeptics and the dreamers. What might it take to get us to shift that? Right? So it's just like a flock of birds that just shifts in midair. You've seen this before. What's going to take to get there? Well, I started this talk by saying, I don't really know what the future of air travel is. Remember this guy? I don't know how to think about that. But maybe if we think broadly and try to do all of these things and recognize all of these implications and aspects and facets of the problem, maybe we can be very confident what that future of aviation is going to look like. Thank you.